Good morning, family. I hope you guys are doing incredible. Welcome to Chandra TV by way of YouTube. So excited to be on with you this morning. Uh, real quick, I want you to let me know how you're doing in the chat. I hope you guys are doing amazing. If you're doing good, I want you to put good in the chat. You're not doing good. You don't know how you're doing. I want you to let me know in the chat. All right. Doing good. Doing great. Okay. Good, good, great. Good, okay. All right. We'll take it, we'll take it, we'll take it. All right, we're getting ready to get started. I am excited about this new teaching that I'm getting ready to jump into today. It is very, very important to where we are, not just in terms of matters of faith, but also in terms of matters of heritage. And so this is Black History Month, so we're going to be conflating two very tense subjects. And so I want you to lean in this month as we dive into this subject matter. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started. I want to prepare you. So those of you who may be fairly new to this community, I want to prepare you. This is this is going to be one of those months where some of the information, some of the content that's going to be shared may be tough for people to embrace, but I want you to embrace it because on the other end of it, we're going to be better because of it. So I'm excited about this information. I want you to open your hearts. I want you to open your minds so that you can receive what God wants to say to us this morning. All right, so let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this opportunity that you've allowed us to come together. We thank you for this medium of technology that allows us to be connected to one another wherever we may be. And so, Father, I pray that as we dive into this word this morning, that you would illuminate the scriptures for us, that you would make it clear to us what you would have us to do. I pray for those who are watching here live. I pray for those who will watch this on the replay. I pray that you would use this word as a tool for transformation, for we don't just want information. We don't just want to be hearers of the word. We want to be doers of the word. So we love you and we thank you for this opportunity. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right, family. So as you know, some of you who may not know, whenever we start a new teaching, whenever we start a new series it is always my goal to ensure that we are clear on what our objectives are. So what are we aiming to do? So when this is over, how will we know that we've actually accomplished our goal if we never set one? So that's important to me when it comes to, to, to teaching and preaching. It's important to me because I want to make sure that we're not just getting together, but that we're actually going somewhere and we're actually growing somewhere. And so I want to be I want to be clear on what our goals are so that when we get to the end of the month, we can look back and say, okay, yeah, we did that. We accomplished that. We were able to achieve this particular goal. So we're starting a new series today. It's called Race-ish. It's called Race-ish. So this is a new thought-provoking series that seeks to confront and understand the historical and contemporary complexities of theology and race. From the painful legacies of chattel slavery to the nuanced forms of subjugation that persist today, this series will explore this deeply rooted tension and its impacts on the way people of color see matters of faith. Okay, so let, let me let me let me break that all the way down. I, I had to I had to give you a more 
scholarly overview, but let me let me put it where you can feel it. So essentially, <laughs> whenever we engage matters of faith, it can be difficult, especially as people of color. Because there have been so many things that have happened to people of color and you wonder how can a good God allow these kinds of things to take place? How do you reconcile your theology and your anthropology? Once again, how do you reconcile your theology and your anthropology? How do you reconcile what you believe about God with what you believe about yourself? And it's a tense line that we walk. And so we're going to walk that line this month. We're going to we're going to unpack this because I believe it is more critical now than ever before that we engage and not run from. So as a as a spiritual family, as a community, we cannot run from these challenges because these challenges, whether we want to admit them or not, are impacting not just us, but it's impacting our emerging generations in ways that we can't necessarily predict. So I want you to buckle up. Race-ish is going to be that kind of series. You're going to need to share these messages with people that you know who may be on the fence about the faith. And one of the reasons why we tend to be on the fence about the faith is because of this kind, these kinds of subject matters. Okay, so I want you to get your Bible. I want you to get your Bible and we're getting ready to go to work. I want you to get your Bible. We're going to go to the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, chapter number two, Exodus chapter two, Exodus chapter I'm going to put it on the screen for you. Those of you who are part of this community, you know how I get down. I want to make sure that we bring the Bible to you. But if you got it on your phone or you got it on some secondary device, then you can pull this up just so you can make sure I'm reading the Bible and not the newspaper. Exodus 2. Verses 23 through 25. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The NLT. Years passed and the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. Okay, don't miss this. They cry out to God. They cry out for help. And the Bible says their cry rose up to God. So I want to talk in this first installment of race-ish from this simple yet impactful subject. Dear God, dear God, dear God, dear God, we're, we're, we're going to go there. We're going to we're going to go there this month. Dear God, listen to me. Don't miss. Don't miss. Don't miss. A, a virtual gathering this month because we're starting with Dear God and next Sunday we're going Dear Black Girl. Don't don't miss it. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be one of those kinds of series. So I need you to be locked in all month. But part one of race ish, Dear God. Okay, you know how I get down. I can't give you a text without some context for fear of conning you out of the truth. So when we enter into the conversation around Exodus, the book means exit. It chronicles God sovereignly orchestrating the exit of his people from Egyptian slavery and bondage. Now, we cannot just start right here 
at the end of chapter two. This is really part of a larger story. Now, many people have been making for centuries the connection between the Israelite slavery and the plight of African Americans. And so in order to really understand how we got here, we can't just start with them crying out to God and then God orchestrating their exodus. We've got to be asking a very important question. How did they end up in slavery in the first place? <laughs> How did they end up? Come on, you're intelligent. You're intelligent. You're intelligent. You went to Sunday school. You, you went to vacation Bible school. How did they end up in slavery in the first place? So before we begin to talk about their exodus, we've got to be clear on their entry. How did they end up in slavery in the first place? I'm glad you asked. I got to give you some some Bible so that we can make sure that we're all on the same page here. So don't miss this. We got to go back one chapter. Exodus chapter one. Exodus chapter one. We got to go back one chapter. Don't get lost. Don't end up in the New Testament. Exodus chapter one. And let me give you some context. How did they end up in slavery in the first place? Exodus chapter one. Let's read verses eight through 11 from the message version. The message version. Now we see some similarities between what we just read in our foundational text and then what we are seeing right now in this context. A new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. Okay, we got to pause. We got to pause right here because we can't take for granted that everybody went to Sunday school. We can't take for granted that everybody understands who these individuals are. You, you remember Joseph in the book of Genesis. He has a dream. He ends up being sold to into slavery by his brothers. He ends up going and through a series of events, he finds himself second in command in Egypt after interpreting Pharaoh's dream. So he Pharaoh has a dream. Joseph gives language to this dream. He tells him there's going to be seven years of plenty. There's going to be seven years of famine. He says, what we're going to do is during the seven years of plenty, while everybody is bawling, we're going to save so that during the famine, we will have enough. And during the famine, when other people run out, now we become a resource for them. He puts together this robust economic plan and allows Egypt to prosper. So as a consequence, Joseph's brothers, they end up having to come to Egypt because of the famine. Joseph reveals himself. So we got this whole family reunion vibe going on. So the people of Israel were able to prosper because of Joseph's work. So I do want to pause and just insert parenthetically. Joseph's life is a reminder to us that if you got your gifts and your talents, your abilities from God, then they work in the marketplace and not just the church. They work in the marketplace and not just the church. They work in the marketplace and not just the church. So Joseph rises to power and as a as a result his people are blessed. But Exodus 1, 8 through 11 tells us a new king came to power who didn't know Joseph. Joseph dies at the end of Genesis and we it opens up this very difficult circumstance for his people. So a new king comes to power. He doesn't know Joseph. So whatever plans, whatever agreements, what whatever contracts were guaranteeing the safety of the people of Israel, that's gone out the window. He spoke to his people with alarm. There are way too many of these Israelites for us to handle. We've got to do something. Let's devise a plan to contain them. Lest if there's a war, they should join our enemies or just walk off and leave us. So the message version kind of sweetens it a bit. So they organize them into work gangs. 
i.e. slavery. Yeah, don't look, let's not play no games. Let's not play no games. They 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 put them in slavery. Put them in hard labor under gang foreman. Now I want you to notice this last line. They built the storage cities for Pharaoh. Now what that sound like to you? Now you're intelligent. Come on, you're you're intelligent. What 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 that sound like to you? What 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 is that? What does that sound? Who that sound like to you? <laughs> you enslave these people, and then you make them build your cities. Okay, I'm gonna pause and let you think about it for a second. Who who who, who that sound? Who that sound like? Who 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 does that? What people group does that remind you of? Now watch this. So so. The people of Israel go from prosperity to oppression relatively quickly. They go from prosperity to oppression really, really quickly. And this can create within us some challenges when we're trying to reconcile our theology with our anthropology. So there are people, ladies and gentlemen, who struggle with God because of the things that have historically happened to people of color, specifically African-Americans. There are people who struggle. They struggle to reconcile. How can a God that is so good allow this kind of thing to happen? Come on, if you ever been there, if you ever thought that, if you ever felt like that, I just want you to put me in the chat. Come on, it's this is an honest community. This is a safe space. If you ever felt like that, I just want you to put me in the chat. If you ever looked around at the plight of our people and you said to yourself, now what God doing? Where, where, where is he? Is he paying attention? How can a God be so good and allow this much evil and this much oppression? I mean, you say something to somebody on a bad day, and it's like you 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 feel like God out to get you, and you look around at other people who are doing all kind of crazy stuff, and you saying God, you don't see them. <laughs> you saying you saying God, you don't, you don't see them. You, you saying God, you you not you you not paying attention to that. It's a struggle. It's a struggle for people to be able to reconcile their theology and their anthropology. So they go from prosperity to oppression because a new king comes to power. A king who didn't know, didn't care about Joseph. So Joseph's Joseph's impact, Joseph's contributions were no longer able to keep them safe. So this new king comes into power. And he sees how numerous the people are. And he devises this plan to contain them. Don't mess with me. He comprises this. He he creates this plan to contain them because he understands that as they continue to grow and as they continue to multiply, that that's going to create a problem down the road. So he attempts to get ahead of the problem by enslaving them. And so the problem is we've been attributing these actions to God. Come on, let's keep it one thou out this morning. We, we, we've, been, we've been attributing these characteristics and we've been attributing these actions to God. And they don't belong to God. Y'all. Y'all not ready. Y'all not ready. I said, we've been attributing these actions to God and they don't belong to God. (laughs) Y'all ready for this? If you're ready for this, put ready in the chat. We've been attributing these actions to God and they don't belong to God. If you're ready for what I'm getting ready to say, I want you to put ready in the chat. (laughs) We've been attributing these actions to God and they don't belong to God. We've been attributing these actions to God and they do not belong to 
God. Y'all ready for this? Don't, don't, don't miss this. Don't miss this. Slavery didn't happen because of God. It happened because of greed. Don't, don't, don't miss this. Slavery didn't happen because of God. It happened because of greed. Oh, come on. I need you to, I need you to pick up what I'm putting down. Slavery didn't happen because of God. It happened because of greed. Let me say it one more time for dramatic effect. Slavery didn't happen because of God. It happened because of greed. Come on, let's keep it 100. Let, let's tell the truth. It, it didn't happen because of God. It happened because of greed. And unfortunately, we've been we've been attributing to God the actions of people. And so you've got people out here, people of color, you got young people of color who are struggling to reconcile their theology and their anthropology because they think that this is something that was done by God. This was not because of God. This was because of greed. Slavery <laughs> in these United States was not because of God. It was because of greed. But people have been led to believe so it's easy in 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 our community. It's easy for us to what well, well why would God Because the truth is when 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 we when we engage these kinds of subject matters, it forces us, watch this, because we can get preoccupied with sovereignty and uh, use it as an excuse to not deal with humanity because humans have free will and the way we manage our free will determines the quality of the world we live in. Don't mess with me. I said the way we manage our free will determines the quality of the world we live in. That's not just on God. Come on. Come on, that's not just on God. The way we choose to manage our free will impacts the quality of the world that we live in. That's not just on God. That's on us. But what happens is because we can't reconcile theology and anthropology, we give up on God. We, we throw God away. But I want to help you reconcile. I want to help you make sense of. I want to help you reconcile. I want to help you make sense of. Because a part of the reason why we struggle to see Theology and race, the reason why we struggle to see ourselves in the biblical text is because of a very intentional, don't, don't miss this, a very intentional, clearly devised and executed plan to ensure that we don't. This was not accident. This was not happenstance. This was not coincidence. We're talking about a clearly devised plan to ensure that we did not. So when we approach scripture and we don't see ourselves in the text, when we approach scripture and we don't see things that impact us, when we look at television and propaganda and we don't see ourselves, it becomes difficult. We talk about representation in other industries. Well, what about representation in matters of faith and theology? 
But there's a reason why you don't see yourself. There's a reason why we approach the scriptures a certain way. There's a reason why we approach. It has been carefully crafted. But I'm getting ready to show you. <laughs> it's been carefully crafted. But I'm getting ready to show you. There's a term that has contributed to this. It's called whitewashing. I want to I want to I want to I want to unpack for you what this means. It's impact on the way we see matters of faith. Remember, that's what this series is about. I want, I want to show you how our inability, this, this tension between theology and race, our inability to reconcile our theology and our anthropology is impacting the way people of color see matters of faith. Watch this. Don't, don't miss this. There's a concept called whitewashing. I want to show you what it means. I want to show you what it means. The Cambridge Dictionary defines whitewashing as an attempt to stop people from finding out the true facts about a situation. Ernest Grant says, whitewashing occurs institutionally and structurally when the contributions of the African diaspora to theology, ethics, and culture are largely ignored and the influence of people groups of European descent are accentuated. Don't miss this. The Cambridge Dictionary defines whitewashing as an attempt to stop people from finding out the true facts about a situation. Ernest Grant says whitewashing occurs institutionally and structurally when the contributions of the African diaspora to theology, ethics, and culture are largely ignored and the influence of people groups of European descent are accentuated. So essentially, this means there has been a considerable amount of of time, energy, and resources put into framing the narrative a certain way. Because in this media-driven age, if you can control the narrative, you can control the people. Y'all, I told y'all it was going to be one of those kind of months. If you can control the narrative, you can control the people. If you can control the narrative, you can control the people. One of the marketing experts says, whoever controls the media controls the culture. So when you look on television, even the religious programming, what Jesus looked like. We see blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. Now, I'm not one of those people who wants to argue that Jesus was black. I just want us to be honest about the fact that he wasn't white. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on. I, I, just, I just want us to keep it. I just want us to keep it 100 about the fact that he wasn't white. But this occurs as a part of whitewashing when 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 the contributions of people of color are being largely ignored. And then people of European, people groups of European descent, their, their contributions, their things are being pushed to the forefront. That's not an accident. And it is happening, not just in culture. It's also happening in church. It's also happening in the faith, in the Christian community. Right. It's, it's, it's not my job to talk about and, and to 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 engage what's going on in, in terms of the culture. Because those industries, many of them, I don't have experience in. But the church. Oh, we got to talk about this in the church. We got to talk about this in the church. There's an individual that I need you to know. His name is James Cone. He is the progenitor, the establishmentarian of black liberation theology. He is the establishmentarian of black liberation theology. Once again, Dr. James Cone, he's gone, he's he slipped into eternity now, but he was the establishmentarian of black liberation 
theology, whose, whose entire premise was God is always on the side of the oppressed. He argues God is always on the side of the oppressed. Okay, I hear some people. I hear some people. I hear some people. Okay, well, Pastor, aren't you being divisive? You're talking about black theology. Aren't you being aren't you being divisive when you talk about black theology? What 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 about white theology? Well, prior to James Cone and the work of others, the only theology was white. Everything we read, every everything we we heard, everything we saw was Eurocentric. He comes along and he says, no, I want people of color. I want black folks to be able to see themselves in scripture. To know, watch this, that when we talk about God, we got to put a line in the sand. Because he can't be Pharaoh's God and Israel's God at the same time. <laughs> you, he, he said, he says, no, 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 no. We got to draw a line in the sand. He is the God of the oppressed. We, we see this furthered in the work of Jesus when he comes and says, I came to set at liberty those who are captive. Don't y'all mess with me. But when people of color don't understand and haven't been introduced to individuals like this, all we have are the Eurocentric perspectives, which is why most young folks, especially who did not grow up in church, believe that Christianity is the white man's religion. OK, I want to show you I want to I want to I want to read to you some stuff that James Cone said. Now, th th this is this is. Because this is the first message, I want to lay some foundation. So I need you to think with me. So those of you who may be new to this, you you may be like, now what kind of what kind of teaching? What kind of what kind of li listen, 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 listen. I want to make sure I undergird this. I want to make sure I'm weaving theology and heritage because we love all people, but we proud to be black. So I want to read to you. I want to I want to read to you what James Cone says. Now it's 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 a, it's a little lengthy, but I need you to hang out with me. I need you to think with me. I'm gonna put it on screen for you. I need you to think with me. I need you to think with me. This is important. This is important. Th this is what we know about James Cone. Cone was writing about black theology at a time when the prevailing question was whether it was possible to be both black and Christian. Most white Christians, including pastors and theologians, had remained silent about the racism and racial, racialized violence being exposed by the civil, right, civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. The civil rights movement was itself suffering major internal strife as younger leaders such as Stokely Carmichael were calling for black power in both economic and political terms. Groups like the Black Panther Party were rejecting the nonviolent passive resistance offered by Martin Luther King Jr. At the same time, most black clergy in the 1960s were not active in the civil rights movement. They did not openly support King. That's a whole nother conversation for another day. They were not preaching a message of freedom and liberation. Most black preachers were still pushing a message of gradualism as far as political freedom was concerned. In addition, rather than urging social and political activism, many black preachers were still engaged in what Benjamin Mays calls compensatory religion. In which personal salvation was the primary goal with freedom and happiness coming by and by in heaven after one's death. Watch this. So some of us grew up in these kind of churches. Where it was just want to make it to heaven. I'm going to struggle, struggle, struggle. And then when I get to the by and by. It's all going to get better. It's all going to get better when I get to heaven. If you if you grew up in that kind of church, put me in the chat. If you grew up in that kind of church where it was, let's just suffer through. Let's just suffer through. And then in the by and by, Jesus going to fix it. Uh, uh. Put it in the chat. I want him to fix it now. Huh? 
I want them to fix it now, not just the by and by. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Mm -mm. I know there's some things I'm going to get when I get to heaven. There's there rewards I'm going to get when I get to heaven, but I don't want to have to wait till I get to heaven to get peace. I don't want to have to wait until I get to heaven to get joy. I don't want to have to wait to get to heaven to have a life that I love. I know that was grandma's reality, but I don't want it to be mine. I don't want to have to wait to, to get to heaven to get relief. That's what come. All right. I got more. I got more. I got more. This, this is also what he says. This is also what he says, which is important. This is important. Don't miss this. The silence on matters of race and racial violence by many black preachers during the first half of the 20th century helped create the context in which Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, and the Nation of Islam advanced the notion that Christianity was the right man's religion and that Islam was the true religion for the black man. All of these concerns led to the question that demanded an answer in the 1960s. Can you be both black and Christian? So because of, please don't miss this family, because of the intentional whitewashing when it comes to the contributions of African Americans, their presence, not just in the, the work of religion, but their presence in biblical texts. There are black folks in the Bible. But the intentional whitewashing has, has caused this internal division where there are certain people, there are certain people of color who think that you are naive if you are Christian. Think you have been hoodwinked if you are Christian. Think you have been bamboozled if you are Christian. Think you are, think you lack intelligence if you are Christian. But what we see, what we see in the biblical text that we read as our foundation, we see something very, very, very important. And I don't want you to miss it. Years pass, the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help. And their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. The challenge that we face, ladies and gentlemen, the challenge that we face is that we don't always understand what God is doing. But what I don't want us to do is, is hold God responsible for the actions and the behaviors of greedy men. Could God have stopped had certain things Absolutely. Why doesn't God stop certain things from happening? We don't know. That's above my pay grade. But I don't want us to be so preoccupied with God that we are absolving ourselves of the responsibility to manage our free will effectively. Because that's what creates these situations and circumstances that marginalize other people, not God. It's us. Humans, people. And so the question we've got to be asking ourselves is how do we manage our own free will in a way that's responsible? And in a way that does not marginalize and subjugate other people. But they cry out to God in, 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 in their in their slavery. And he knows it's time to act. 
there are questions that I don't have answers to. There are questions that no person, I don't care how spiritual, I don't care, nobody has answers to. But there is something we need from God. And I want to leave you with that something. Those of you who are new to this community, every every time I deliver any type of teaching lesson message, I want to make sure I provide a sticky statement because people don't remember sermons. They remember statements and they remember phrases from sermons. And so I want to give you a phrase, a statement to remember. When we say, dear God, this is what we're asking for. We're asked, we're not asking to know the plan. We're asking for the faith to continue to believe that there is one. We're not asking to know the plan. Because if you've been saved longer than two weeks, you know you're not going to know the plan. But we are we are asking for the faith to continue to believe that there is one. People don't give up because they don't know the plan. People give up because they stop believing there is one. P- people don't turn back just because they don't know the plan. People turn back because they've stopped believing that there is one. And I don't know who you are that's tapped in to this lesson right now. But I want to encourage you. We don't know the plan. But I need you to believe with everything that you have that there is one. No matter what season of difficulty you find yourself situated in, I need you to believe that there is one. If James Cone is right and God is on the side of the oppressed, we may not know the plan, but we got to believe with everything in us that there is one. And sometimes this is the most effective prayer you can pray. Sometimes this is the most effective prayer you can pray. I'm not asking you to know the plan because I know your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. But what I'm asking you to do is give me the faith to believe that there is one. Not knowing the plan is going to frustrate me. But not believing there is one. That's going to be the end of me. And so I want to encourage people everywhere, but specifically people of color. Continue to believe that there is a plan. If God's not doing what you think he should be doing, there's a reason why. Okay, I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been inspired. I hope you've been challenged. As I mentioned during this first installment, it's a little more heavy. We'll get practical as we as we go. But I want to make sure we lay a foundation for how we got here. 
what's feeding and fueling this tension between theology and race and how we need to shift our focus and how we need to put the responsibility in the lap of humanity and not divinity because it wasn't God's choices that put us in this predicament. It was the choices of greedy men. And we've got to make sure that when God puts us in positions of power, when God allows us to be Pharaoh, that we're not perpetuating the same type of dysfunction, but that we're actually serving people the way God would want us to serve people. Okay, so I hope this has been enlightening for you. I hope this has been challenging for you. I'm so excited that you tapped in with me this morning. As I mentioned, all month long. I'm going to be in, I'm just warming up. I'm going to be in this all month long. I am just getting started. Next Sunday, same time, same place. Dear black girl, because in the midst of everything that's been going on in terms of people of color, the African-American race, no group has been more marginalized and subjugated than black women. Oh, we talking about it. We talking about it too. next week. We talking about it next week. So I need you to be here. I need you to be here live and in living color because we going there. There's a black girl in the text. She in the Bible. <laughs> and I'm getting ready to show you her next week. So thank you so much for tapping in with us. We're going to put our giving screen up. Thank you guys so much for your support, your generosity. It's what allows us to continue to serve people. Those of you who are not a part of our community, if you at any point just listen to any of these teachings or other things that will be on this page and you say this bless me and you want to help us to help more people, then you can do so by way of these two giving options. If you're a part of our community, once you stay tapped into your emails and all of that good stuff, we're going to send you the playlist for the week via email so that you can have it at your disposal. We'll make sure that we send you the link for this. And all we ask is that if you can share this with as many people as possible, you help us continue to help people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this opportunity that you've allowed us to come together. Thank you for reminding us in your word that you see us, you hear us. And that in your divine timing, you will act. Thank you for all of those people of color throughout history who've made contributions to theology, to ethics, to culture. I pray that as we go through this series this month, that you would help us to see how valuable not just we are as individuals, but how valuable our work is, our contributions to society. I pray that it would light a fire under each of us, that we would do our part to make our contributions in the time in which we've been born. We love you. We thank you. Keep us safe until we meet again. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, family. You guys take care. We will see you soon.